Smells kind of musty in here. Oh. Hi, right. there's a dead Plymouth garage. I'm Colin. On this episode, we're gonna bring the Fury back to life. I haven't really touched it since I finished up the last video. And in fact, uh, something in the ignition system died and I haven't even driven the car in about a month. You know, that's a problem. We're going to rip the engine out of the Valiant today and hopefully get toward making this a reliable daily driver again. For those keeping track at home, I got about three months before I got to start driving this car all the way across the country. And it's not remotely ready. But hey, that's part of the challenge. That's part of the fun. We'll get there. Probably. Wonder how long it's been since Jamie started this. It'll go. Or it launched another ignition module. I built this engine uh, a long time ago. What year is this? 2016? It's an 89 360 with a roller cam. It's got magnum heads and a cheap eBay air gap. In this car, it got about 21 and a half, 22 miles a gallon on the highway. There's really nothing trick in this engine. It's got flat top pistons with valve reliefs, a tiny baby cam that's like 208 at 050 on the intake side. The headers, of course, which are these are the cheapest, summitiest headers you can get, and they leak everywhere. It should be pretty reliable for our many mile cross country trip. All we have to do is pull the radiator, battery, drive shaft, exhaust, accessories. Did I already say shifter? We'll just yank the engine and transmission out as a unit. Are you sure we have to do all this just to change the coil? In the Fury? Oh. Okay. Is this out yet? Um, yeah, it's out right now. Can't you tell? And it's just that easy. I'm hungry though. I need some lunch. Now we need to roll this out and roll the Fury in and just <laughs> that right in there. I guess there's a 318 to get out of the way first. Oh yeah, it doesn't run. I sure hope these actually fix it. First, we'll see if it magically fixed itself. Huh. 
Alright. I that was too easy. Maybe I flooded it last time. Usually this thing fires right up just like that. Oh, I can't wait to be rid of that squeaky belt. Now I should make sure to get this thing really hot so it's really difficult to uh, work on. Took a little lunch break and now I gotta clean off the car so we can push this one out and get the Fury in. Did I mention this crazy trip we're going on? Um, we're leaving for in just over three months. I'm gonna reuse the bell housing that's in the Fury so I don't have to take apart the uh, hydraulic clutch pieces, even though I need to pull apart the hydraulic master cylinder and replace it with a different one I have in a drawer because the one in the Fury leaks. When I bought this transmission, it had that shifter that's in the bucket on it and I paid a whopping $125 for it. Now mind you, that's in like $2014, which were worth more, but still. Even back then it was a good deal. Of course it leaks a little now. I've put thousands of miles on this transmission. It, uh, I definitely got my money's worth. I'm gonna put this in a corner somewhere, maybe by the charger. Eventually it's gonna go on the 318 from the Fury, the Smoky Boy, to go in my Dart. I'll move this out of the way and get the picker ready and we're just gonna yoink the 318 right out of the Fury as fast as we can. And go. This cherry picker wouldn't be half as bad if this wheel weren't trying to fall off. Maybe if we replaced it and it could turn and do wheel things, this wouldn't suck so much. I have to turn this around in this tiny space with a crappy picker with no handles so I can get the engine out of the way so I can get the Fury in and pull the engine out of that. I guess we'll put the 360 in the way but in a way that makes sense. All right, I think this one's gonna be easier for a couple of reasons. A, we're not removing the transmission. I'm gonna leave the transmission leave the bell housing, we're only pulling the engine. So I only have to unhook cooling system, exhaust, and you know, some little stuff, but that's it. This will come right out. For the most part, this thing's just gonna go yoink. This radiator, it's actually bolted in properly. So you pull the upper two bolts, loosen the bottom two, or in my case, the bottom one, and uh, she just lifts right out. Try and pour out some of the coolant and make a big mess with it. You do things the right way around here, sometimes. This particular car, I've upgraded it to electronic ignition, which is just kind of glued here. Uh, this wire goes to the coil. This power wire goes to the ballast resistor. And uh, that's it. The other ones just go to the distributor. So I'm gonna unplug those. And, um, <laughs> and we're unwired. Boom. Oh, look at that. That's choice. Where's the cutters we're not supposed to use? It's actually pretty uh, legit. I don't even know why I'm trying to cut it. Like, that's a waste of zip ties. Cool. 1406, yeah, this is just a regular 650. Uh, the one, that one, that's a 750, actually. Uh, we're definitely gonna be using that still. That's obnoxiously orange. Yeah, why not, okay. Oh, that's why not. 
That's better. Let's stick them on there. We will definitely not regret doing it this way. Oh, I'm a fan of the carb spacer if you haven't learned. Carb spacers and four speeds. This is the way. There are people online that just do not like using lift plates at all. They don't trust them. But you know how much these little bolts are capable of holding? It's more than you might think, which is why lift plates work. Darn it. Oh, yeah. Thought that should work. I was about to move on to bell housing, but I think we should probably do the starter. Uh, the really awesome part is I Loctited this bolt last time I put it in, so this might suck. Oh, never mind, we're good. Loctite sucks. I rule. <sighs> A lot of people, especially when you use red Loctite, just like freak out. Especially if you put it in certain places that they don't think is proper. Why would you do that? You can't put red Loctite on that. You'll ruin it. Nah. Put Loctite wherever you want. If you want stuff to stay tight. If you don't know what all these bolts are and where they go, bag and tag them. I know where all these bolts go because I put them in and I took them out. And uh, wait, what are these ones? Anyway, if you don't know where they go, bag and tag. You know, I could just sauce all this now and get it out of the way. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? Yay! face. Good thing I never put the uh, front part of these shields in. That'd be inconvenient. But this part, I think it's pretty essential. This one's not any cleaner than the one in the Valiant was. In fact, it's almost worse. I should... This is just gonna hang once I get this out of the way. Oh my god. Um, remember when the starter bolt fell out and I was having trouble starting the car? Um, it was making horrible grinding noises. That shouldn't, that shouldn't, that shouldn't do that. It shouldn't be like that. Well, that's the second mini starter nose cone I've broken. And I guess I do need the starter out of the Valiant. Sorry, Jamie. Because that's not going to fly. Oh, right. I never actually pulled the manifold. too easy. This exhaust has been in the car as long as I've had it. In fact, that was one of the reasons I've got this car. Because it had an exhaust and transmission and everything just ready for an engine. What else do you notice in here? There's a socket. I've never taken these manifolds off. They've been in the car since I got it. Um, so I've never had them upside down. I don't even know what to say. That's funny. 
All right, this is a little stupid. So I'm trying to get this out. It's like the last thing other than the bell housing bolts. I got the throttle cable unhooked, the oil pressure line, but this guy, stupid little brass fitting, is trying to strip with a crappy wrench. A crappy wrench that says snap on on it, by the way. This is the best angle and it won't. It just won't. Oh. These look like they suck. Hopefully it will grab this tight enough that it won't strip. Oh my god, dude. Oh, wow. What a debacle. I can't believe that was so tight. Okay. Fixed. Crisis averted. So now... The just one more thing left that I keep saying is actually the last thing left. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah, that's freedom. Hey, I uh, found where some of that oil was going. Oh. I mean, all over the side of the engine, but well, yeah. also in a couple of these here cylinder holes. Well, yeah. Ugh. That's fine. I guess we could fix that before we put it in the dart. I see no reason to install that engine in the engine without Just to get it out of the way. If you've never uh, removed one of these power steering boxes, it's not that hard. It's, it's just three bolts and the steering column and the pump. We're gonna leave the pump on for this because I don't want to make two messes. But I had to jack it up so I could fit an impact on the pitman arm nut. Yep. I pre-loosened those. Those were not actually that loose. This is a pitman arm puller. It pulls pitman arms once you get it on there. Hey, it's on there. I need two hands. And to not point the camera at my leg. What did Henry say last time? He, he needed like eight arms. Pitman arm puller. It pulls pitman arms. Who wants to watch me drop a steering box on my leg? I do! That's a problem. Okay, it finally came out. Oh, it's heavy. 
I guess that's why I'm eliminating it, huh? Uh, what are you doing right now? Oh, I do like spending money. That's true. All right, let's replace it with one that's more betters. Well, here's what's hopefully gonna make this car great. The Borgeson steering box, which is smaller, lighter, and uh, I sure hope less leaky than this old worn out piece of garbage. Uh, I got a kit from, what's his name? Bergman. Bergman, Autocraft. And I got new thicker tie rod ends that we're gonna install too, if I remember. Um, it's got everything you need to hook up to a regular box and it should make it uh, an easy install, maybe. There's actually quite a bit of room around this engine with the exhaust manifolds in it. I probably could have replaced this without pulling the engine, but uh, I didn't wanna. So here we are. It's so cute and little. It was all worth it just for that. It's the next day. Borgeson box still looks great in there. I've got all the parts to assemble the coupler. And this is a special um, long one that I got with the Borgeson box from Bergman so that you can just hook your factory column up and, and not have to cut it. It's going to be pretty good. Um, I've already got the box marked for where center should be, so I'm going to center it back up and uh, start working on the coupler. Uh, <clears throat> actually, before I do that, I, I really want to clean some of this. I can't handle this, especially if we're going to sit on it again. If I were smart, I would tow the car to my work and use the steam cleaner there and just blast all this off. But getting kind of a late start in the day here. It's already noon and I want this thing to run before it's dark. I don't want this not to be black anymore. <sighs> Ooh. Let's do some satisfying grease scraping. Mostly of the spot where I gotta sit my butt in a couple minutes to continue working on the steering coupler. The really cool thing to do would be to blast all this grease off and repaint the K-frame. <sighs> but this car is gonna drive out of here by tonight. All right, if you've never assembled one of these, it's pretty easy. Now, I'm gonna hope that I don't have to drive out this pin because it really sucks. And yeah, if I were smart, I'd be replacing the little rubber bushing here that's torn and ripped and is supposed to pop on there, but um, I didn't order one, even though I've had this steering box in a box ready and waiting to go for, you know, three months or whatever. We're going to start by putting on the new boot and retainer. These kind of suck, um, but I'm going to try and do it without pulling the pan. Should be able to, as long as this is stretchy enough. Oh, without tearing. Yeah. All right. Got our retainer. All right, I got the shoes and the little spring clip on there. Um, I think I'm ready to grease this thing up and put the coupler on for real this time. It's kind of a snug fit. Pretty greasy. I've seen some guys drill and tap this for a zerk so that you can just re-grease it from time to time. That might be nice, but I don't know how really necessary it is. So I'm gonna skip that. There we go. Yep. No problem. I've got the coupler on. I'm trying to install the tiny roll pin and it doesn't want to go in the hole. 
Um, and it kind of doesn't matter if it won't, because I've got an extra little wire clip thing that clips onto the coupler and then into the roll pin hole here, which isn't even used in this application, and it'll retain everything here. But I'd like to have the tiny roll pin in anyway, just for good measure. Okay, um, we are skipping the tiny roll pin, which wasn't even really a roll pin, but uh, I got it started in the hole. I just held it with little pliers and, and got it to start in there. And then I tried to bonk it in the rest of the way and it just bent. And when I went to try and see if I could straighten it or do anything, it just popped right back out of the hole and fell onto the ground. So I'm gonna skip that, move on to the next stupid piece here. Okay, we've got this nice grease seal. Then we've got the nice retainer. I don't really have the best of luck with these either, but basically we're just gonna bend these teeth down and it'll be installed until it falls off because they never really stay on there that well. I need to hook up the steering column, which means I need to center the steering box again, which means I need to jack up the car so I can turn the wheels easier and get it perfect. But if I'm gonna jack up the car, I should put it on the lift so I can take the tie rod ends off because I have new tie rod ends for the car. But to get it on the lift, I need the right engine on the cherry picker ready to go in in this tiny space here. So to do that, I have to move this engine. And with a normal cherry picker that the wheels can just turn, I would just flop it around and stick it in the corner there. But I can't. So I'm jacking it up. I gotta pull the clutch off. I'm gonna put it on an engine stand and just roll it out of the way because that'll be easier. Then I can get the right engine on the stand and bring it over and then bring the car back forward and get it on the lift. So many steps here. Learned something important here when I was trying to steer the front wheels of the car and it's that uh, apparently my car has a large sector shaft pitman arm on it which doesn't, you know, fit the small sector shaft I ordered. Well, I pulled the whole steering linkage out of the car. I had to unhook this side of it to fit the driver's side header in because it's the crappy style. And I'm replacing these tie rod ends anyway, so I just popped it all out and I'll reinstall it once the engine and the exhaust is in. Which I think we're ready to start once I transfer engine mounts to the 360. It's hard to tell, but this thing's been leaking clutch slash brake fluid out of the back of itself. And it's been coming down here and getting all over the floor and stripping up more white paint. This thing's only been leaking for the last three years or whatever. And I've got this one. Right here. That should not be wet back there. Well, this clutch master cylinder really isn't any cleaner than the old one, but it won't leak and it's ready to go back in. Oh, that was way easier than taking it out. about putting anti-seize on this stud but I don't want to. Ah, still hitting the bracket a little. I'm just gonna roll with that for now. I'm tired of this. Remember when I said I wanted to drive the Fury out before it was dark? That was a funny joke. Finally gonna pull this actual last thing out of the Valiant and I'm gonna try not to bloodbath the yard. No guarantees. Oh, that's weird. There's no mess. Well, everything I've tried to do today has been a debacle. That line, the pressure line, the fitting's too big to fit the... I don't even know what I did with it now. This is going great. Anyway, it's too big for the included fitting for the box. So I need to probably just buy a different line. There, I should be able to find something in stock 
at one of the parts stores. It won't be a big deal. It's just another thing on the list of stuff that should have been easy, and it wasn't. And I'm pretty over the whole steering situation as a whole. What with, you know, not even physically being able to steer the car with the steering box because I didn't know I had a large sector pitman arm. I'm just going to put the engine in and uh, hopefully get it to run. Once it's in, there's really not much to hook up and make run. I won't be able to steer the car. I still got to go rob a pitman arm off of a different car and then figure out a hose. But uh, if I can get it to the point where everything else is done, then I can do that in the morning and drive the car out. And take it on a test drive. It's good enough. At least it's in. It's 540, which means I've... I think I started at this around noon today and really haven't made any significant progress. It's kind of annoying. Oh, one last, last thing. I thought I was done with last things, but usually you want to measure the back surface where the bell housing is touching. And um, I can't do that because... The bell housing's on and I'm not unbolting it this late in the game. I just want to throw the engine in. So maybe I'll measure to the bottom of the bell housing and then on the other side I'll just measure from the fingers of the pressure plate to the back of another bell housing, which is not going to be entirely accurate. As long as it shows we have a gap, I'm throwing this thing together. This is not how you're supposed to measure. It's two and, I don't know, seven eighths? So the surface of that is three and a quarter, which means you need an eighth inch gap. So I would need three and an eighth from the fingers to the bell housing. So this sticks way too far out. Just trying to remove this hydraulic throw out bearing. I can get it to move on the thing, but the inside sleeve isn't coming out. I pulled the set screw on the little adapter piece here. The set screw's totally out. It won't budge, it won't turn. Yeah. All I wanted was to throw the 360 in. Didn't think every little thing that I tried to do would be a debacle. But here we are. What was I saying about everything being a debacle? The inner sleeve of the slave cylinder is seized to the bearing retainer of the transmission. I can't pull the bearing retainer without pulling the bell housing, which is what I wouldn't, didn't want to do in the... Yeah! Anyway, um, well, I hope this works. I think the bubbles are a good sign. We're cooking now, boys. Oh my god. This has an O-ring in it, too. And it was seized on there pretty good. So I guess we're going to grease it this time. I don't even know why there would be an O-ring in there. Jesus Christ, it's not torn somehow. Ooh, if I drop that right now, that'd be funny. It is hot. The fire worked. Ugh. That's still hot. Also. Ugh. That took way too long. <sighs> Debacle. You know it's New Year's? New Year's Eve anyway. It'll be 2024 in just a minute. Well, still several hours, but you know, a metaphorical minute. You always want to be, you always want to be really careful taking this apart because these O-rings are pretty uh, delicate. I have broken the O-ring in this before. Um, it exploded in very impressive fashion. I probably overextended it, um, but the way it's set up now, it shouldn't be able to do that. Back together. All right, I've got the actual bell housing we're gonna use on here. We're measuring from the forks to the edge of the hole, and that's like three and a half, like dead on. Now we're going to measure from the face of the transmission to the face of the throwout pairing. I'm going to grab a second 
object, probably this wrench at my foot that's uh, relatively flat and make sure I'm getting the right measurement here. I got our actual measurement on the bell housing side, which is three and seven sixteenths. On the transmission side, it's three and three sixteenths, which leaves a gap of exactly a quarter of an inch. The range they say is uh, 0.1 to 0.2. The Chrysler shims are 0.063 inches according to uh, American Powertrain's website. And so if we subtract one of those, if I know how to do math, that puts us right at 0.187, which is perfect. I'm gonna go on a quest to find one more of those shims, and then I will finally be able to install this engine. And it only took all day. Ah, the trusty red toolbox. Aha, uh -huh. it's literally under everything. Ah. Um. It's not in there. I was wondering where this was recently. Not that I want to use that steering wheel, but... Oh, wait, yeah, I do. I was going to put it on the dart. My green dart. Did you know I have a dart? All kinds of goodies, but what I don't see... are shims. Ow. It's a hydraulic clutch. I should be working on this. I'm supposed to work on it tomorrow. It's probably not going to happen. That's not helpful. Jags. Anyway. And I didn't find them, so. Next, we're gonna rip the pitman arm off this car. Tom, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. I will put a pitman arm back on this car. Uh, I guess to be able to put one on, I gotta be able to get this one off first. Uh, here we don't go. Wow, that's horrible. This is ridiculous. I should not have to work this hard to get a pavement arm. God! Well, I finally got the arm to pop, which is great. Except that the nut got destroyed by the puller in the process, and now... It's so gouged up, it's stuck on the stud, and I, 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 I can't get it off. I'm really not very smart sometimes. I forgot I literally have a battery-powered cutoff tool here. So I can carefully grind off the ruined bits of nut that are, that's stopping me from removing it. That was quite possibly the dumbest thing I've had to do today. And that's saying something. But you know what? I managed to get it off without destroying the pitman arm. So now... I have a pitman arm. And it might even be the right one. That looks like a smaller hole. The boot's torn, whatever. I'll replace it later. Well, that's a pretty good summary of how my day has been going. Things that should take five or ten minutes have taken an hour. Pretty much every single one of them. It's nine o'clock now. Will the Fury run before 2024? I don't know. I never found the right shims, but I've got backup options. The best part about spending all that time getting a Pitman arm is I, I'm not even going to uh, put it on tonight. We got a random assortment of old diff shims and such, and I found some in there that I think are pretty close to the right size. I'm gonna find one or a combination of them that's approximately the same thickness. We know we don't have to be exact because we've got some wiggle room, so if it ends up a little thicker, no problem. I just need something close to the right size that's gonna shim it correctly. Not quite exact, but it's pretty close. Now the diameter here is a little bigger. So I'm going to sandwich these shims between the normal shims and the bearing. 
and that's going to make our shim stack. And that should be good, or at least good enough. Still too far to the passenger side. Oh, that's perfect. Ish. I've never had shiny headers before. The really unfortunate part about this is that they're not going to be shiny by the time the engine's installed. trans jack more than uh, right now we're like like this if I lower the trans jack we're gonna be like that so I don't want that my strap there's not really lifting it I think I still need to get in a little so I can go down They're not going in, and it doesn't look like it's not quite the right angle. It's sure trying to be in there, but it's not. It really sucks trying to spline the shaft like this, but I did not want to pull this transmission too. So, we're close. Our angle not quite right. I try and wiggle it a little and it gets better and then it gets worse again. So I don't know. I'm going to wrestle it for a bit and see what we can do. Look at that header. It's shiny. The engine is finally in. Look at how much room is around these headers. In the Valiant, like the whole steering coupler rubs on that tube. Um, it definitely sits like the engine mount was sitting down too far and it was sitting on that steering box. I mean, not that one, but you know, they're sitting on that tube. These are nice and shiny and they actually fit pretty okay for the style they are. Um, this side, as you saw, I dropped in right before I started inserting the clutch because I knew I was going to have troubles getting it around the bell housing. And then this side, after I stopped uh, recording before, I just lowered the engine a teeny bit, wiggled it, and it slid right into place, no problem. So I got the bell housing bolted up. Um, I lowered it onto this mount and started the nuts, and then I used the cherry picker to lift it up, and I was able to slide it in from beneath after I very carefully lifted the car back up. I was very delicate, making sure I only pulled the engine up just enough that it was starting to pull on that mount, not actually lifting the front of the car because that would be bad of course it helps that all the steering linkage is out um and it's a b body so there's a lot of room this was probably one of the easiest header installs i've ever done motor mounts are on it's header gasket time i'm going to torque them to spec which 
I think they even call out a torque spec on here. Mopar V8, torque to 20 foot-pounds. Cool. Oh yeah. Good little bit tighter. Boom. Good timing, Sky. And that's how to install a header. You do not need an expensive snap-on torque wrench to torque things properly, but it helps. We've got headers, and they're actually bolted on now. Not nearly the progress I hoped for today, but it's in there, and uh, hopefully this video will serve as a reminder to install the bell housing guard and reroute that starter wiring first. Well, it's finally tomorrow. I'm gonna lift it back up and fix that starter wiring and install the clutch guard. So I got the starter bolted up properly and I rerouted the wires to go that way where they completely avoid all the header tubes and I'll be able to tie them up in such a way they don't interfere with anything. So I got the clutch guard on and I'm starting to install our steering linkage here. I did gack the threads a little bit on the pitman arm so I'm gonna have to probably file them and make them perfect but um, steering is starting to come together. Collector, reducer, sleeve, and the sleeve sits right on the floor. I scooched the reducer as far forward as it could, same with the adapter, and now it's not hitting the floor. It's still super close, but um, it's not touching, so I'm gonna go ahead and chop the pipe right here after this bend, and it should have just enough space to sneak in there. Yeah, well, it, this has the angle I need to shoot off that way. So we cut it, we weld it to the adapter we already have, and then we'll cut out about that much. We need another of that same sleeve, and then it'll be done. And the other side I already have figured out. So, hopefully AutoZone has that sleeve, and the exhaust will be done. Because yeah. O'Reilly only had two. Sleeve. What? Same sleeve you already bought? Yeah. They only had two, cut right to close. You're welcome. That is going to be. Perfect. Or at least good enough. I got the header collectors mostly done, but I need one more of these two inch inner diameter sleeves so I can hook this side to the car. But other than that, exhaust is almost done. I found everything I needed at the AutoZone. We got the last couple clamps and the uh, sleeve. And uh, yeah, now we can finish the exhaust up and move on to everything else.
actually grounding really well for being on the wrong header. Better. These are Mr. Gasket. I was just looking at the package, but it says a 7177. Got these at the same local parts store that I get the Remflex header gaskets at. Ta-da! It's a little ugly, but uh, it works. Copper gasket, collector, reducer, adapter, old grungy exhaust pipe. Look at that! The exhaust is done. The welds are a little boogery, but they'll hold well enough. At least until I can get it all redone in full two and a half out the back. The main problem here is this thread. It's kind of crunched down, and you can't uh, thread it past it. It's like touching the thread above it. And since I can't easily get a Pitman arm today, and it's my fault this one's dork, this is my life now. If I could get the stud to pop into the linkage a little more, then I could just ram the nut home and it'd be fine. But because the stud is spinning, I can't quite just ream it on there. I'm going to keep filing the stud until I can get that nut on. I put this tie rod end on to help hold up the center link. Filed that stud on the pitman arm bit by bit. And I got the nut to go a little further, a little further, a little further. And then I wasn't making much progress. So I tried the pry bar onto the pitman arm again. And I managed to get it to hold the stud just enough. I was able to ram it on there. So our pitman arm debacle is over. The steering linkage is together and like half of it's pinned. I miss, well, a third of it is pinned. Oh, I don't think I tightened this one. Hmm, maybe I'll drop the car on my head right as we finish the last thing here. <sighs> yep. Okay. Steering linkage is officially done. I've had the car on the lift all day and I'm only just now getting ready to lower it down and Start doing everything else. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's why those hoses were so long. I'm gonna have to do something about that. Try to make it shorter and that's actually worse. It's starting to look like an engine. Currently, I'm learning things about the alternator. The hole in the alternator is like half stripped, so it can't get tight. So I can't get the belt fully tight, which is probably why this car has had a squeaky belt for so long. So I guess I am using the uh, alternator that was on the Valiant, which is really annoying because um, I already have this one in here. Oh well. Presto changeo. Got the alternator swapped out. Um, can throw the power steering pump in and then we're ready for a radiator and plug wires. I got the solid fan reinstalled with this radiator because the clutch fan was too tall. It was also too tall uh, to fit in there with this radiator. So I'm not sure which one I was using before when I had this engine in because I swear the clutch fan was always on this engine, but I could be wrong. So I put it in, I'm starting to fill the radiator and I'm doing one of Jamie's favorite techniques, which is Pop the thermostat open so you kind of burp the engine as you fill it. So you pour coolant in through the radiator here. And then when you start to see it coming through the thermostat, you pop the thermostat back closed and pop the hose on. And uh, you're done. And, and uh, burping it is a whole lot easier when you do that. Because you won't have a giant air pocket there behind the thermostat. At worst, you'll just have a little one. All this coolant I'm putting in, I drained out of the 318 because it looked nice and green. Coolant looks fine. I'm reusing it. I would. Oh. Boom. Oh. 
That was easy. I don't know what's going on with this guy. He just kind of seized up. It says ideal, but not really acting ideal. Ugh. That's pretty big. She'll do. I did get the uh, power steering pump in there. It's all bolted onto the engine. I've got the return line routed. I just need the right fitting to make the pressure line happen and we'll have power steering. I should probably do new cap rotor wires soon. Ugh, these are looking a little haggard. The plug wires were new, but you know, at least one is slightly burned up on headers. It's just, it's just not the most ideal. Four. One, eight, four, three, six. And two. Tons of clearance around the header on this side. All right. Nothing shorting out or anything. That's good. Or normally I'd look and see if I have any parts left over, but you know, I, I took two engines out of two cars, so I've got a lot of parts left over. What was melting? My sniffer ain't working, so I don't know what's trying to melt. I don't see anything getting hot, but something sure is sizzling. Oh, it's that. It's just a sucky connection. Exhaust is still smoking, but there was uh, a good bit of oil that went through the pipe, so I'm really not surprised. That's going to take a bit to burn all that off. Should it really be any surprise that I took a perfectly good running engine out of one car, put it into another, and it still runs good? No, not really. But that wasn't the point here either. The point was to upgrade this specific car, and uh, <laughs> I'd say we've done pretty well with that. Uh, obviously, we still got a couple things to button up, mostly steering related, but that's okay. Right now, it runs great, it sounds great, I'm really happy with it, honestly. I reused, I pointed out I was going to reuse the electronic ignition because I thought the ignition in the Valiant was having issues and this totally proved it. I've got the same distributor and coil that were in the Valiant and all we did was swap from the HEI to the electronic ignition and it runs great. It sounds great. No stumble, no nothing. Got a couple things to address. But overall, I would call the Fury upgraded. I would even go so far as to do this. I didn't really get up to temperature, but I think it'll be fine. 
Oh, there we go. Okay, we got our pressure fitting in, and I've got the solution, I think, to all of our power steering problems. This is a pressure line off of a 70 Dodge Dart with a Saginaw pump, and uh, it's got the right fittings on both ends, and I think it's going to fit. I don't know. Here's the number. It's either going to work or it's not. <laughs> I'll find out. All right, I got the box end hooked in down there and, and started to thread, and now we're gonna find out if this fits. It's very close. I might need to bend that out. No, this has to come up in a way, because of the way it's bent. Ugh. This may not technically be right, but a lot of people use regular ATF in this anyway. So what's it gonna hurt? It's just a slightly fancier ATF. Um, some people run ATF plus four. I'm kind of surprised Jamie doesn't have any of that in stock since that's a pretty typical Chrysler fluid. But, uh, eh, whatever. Oh no, I overflowed. I do that every time. Power steering just hates me. If we get these fluids topped off and their various systems bled, we could potentially test drive the car tonight. Oh, hi, hot dog. What are you doing? Okay. Oh, yeah, and while we're here, we're gonna press on the clutch and see if it'll do anything. Oh, and we need to hook up these wires. <laughs> going to be a annoying noise, but anyway. And it's either my imagination or it's actually starting to feel like something. Yeah, this is how you're supposed to do it when you're alone, is just pump it up a million times until it feels like a clutch. That is not a clutch yet, but it's it's becoming one. Can you hand me that little trim piece on the ground by your boot? Yep. Thank you. Can you point it at what I'm doing? Just try and capture this. I just have a few screws to install, a flashlight to knock over. Now it is. Don't overdo it. Check it out, buddy. We have steering again. It feels really good so far. Double check the fluid, crank the engine, and then we'll do that again with it running. Here, bud. I've been really excited to try one of these Borgeson steering boxes ever since I learned about them. Been even more excited since I got this one. And uh, it's just been sitting around in a box waiting for me. I'm very much looking forward to giving it a shot and seeing just how much better it is. In the factory box. Whoopsies! Hey, that was convenient. We've used firm feel boxes before. I really like firm feel. This car has firm feel torsion bars. I've installed other firm feel products. But I, I decided that a Borgeson box, it really only costs a little bit more than a firm feel rebuild. And I think it'll be better in the long run. All right, I'm gonna crank it and see if it sucks down any power steering fluid. <laughs> It did not. Yep, it's power steering. No noise at all from the pump. I'm gonna set it on the ground and make sure it's that good with a load on it. Oh, dude. Cool. Let's see if the clutch works at all. It's almost starting to feel like something. We'll probably have to actually bleed it, which is great because it just took it off the lift for some reason. Oh! Never mind. That's perfect. Anyway. I 
think it's done. Oh, Fury. All right, buddy, buckle your seatbelt. Alright, it's day four, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, oh, uh, it's day five of Fury Upgrades Round 2. Clutch pedal feels pretty good now and isn't making horrible noise, that's the good news. We've left quite the messy mess and now we're going to unmess it. Alright, here's a reason why cleaning is important. When I put the pitman arm on, I just kind of put it on and slid it on a little bit and just kind of snugged the nut. And I was going to go back later once I knew everything was in the right spot. So when I put the pitman arm on, I left this washer out. And that means the pitman arm doesn't have this washer and isn't fully tight. So when I go under there to lift the torsion bars up, I need to take the nut off the pitman arm, put this in, and then, uh, I don't know, tighten the pitman arm maybe. Yeah, that's gonna have to do. Let's get this thing in here now. First, most important thing to do while it's in the air, pitman arm nut. <laughs> yeah. Man, I need to actually ram it on there a little more first. Cause you, you need the pitman arm on the box a certain amount before you can get the washer on. That's pretty good there. <laughs> That'll certainly help our steering situation. Some people uh, Loctite that nut. I think. I think that'll be fine. Ugh, I'll check it at some point. Okay, thing number two, we need to Secure our clutch line so it doesn't fall down and melt on the header. As usual, our friend Mr. Zip Tie is going to solve this one for us. And... Yoink! Alright, that wasn't quite flush, but good enough. I... think I put my tie rod sleeves backwards slash upside down. Sorry, Bergman. People just have to read that upside down. Thing three, we are going to adjust the height of our torsion bars. This car sits pretty low in the front, and while I like it being low, especially for handling purposes, this header is a little low, and I don't want to drag it on the ground. So, we're going to lift the front end. I think I'm going to go two whole turns. The last thing we're going to do once we do that is we are going to put our proper um, matched set of wheels back on the front. I was feeling a little bit of weirdness in the front end, when I had them on before, I'm hoping it was the big wide tires accentuating the sloppiness of the box. It just felt weird. Um, could be a wheel issue, not sure. I need to have them checked and, and make sure they're actually balanced. But for now, I'm gonna throw them back on the front of the car. When I adjust these torsion bars, I like to go quarter turn at a time. So we're gonna line this up right about here. I'm gonna go 90 degrees eight times, four, now the nice thing about these, uh, they haven't been sitting in a field rusting for the last 30 years or whatever the Barracuda was doing, and so I can actually turn these by hand instead of doing the impact. 
It's just a little more gap than I was hoping for, especially with how tucked the rear is. On the other hand, the car looks like it's sitting pretty level now, which it wasn't before. I don't know if that's too high or not, but you know what's great? That's kind of the whole point of this. This is called the Quick Trick Alignment System or something. I've seen this online before and I was really interested in it. And then Jamie got this from someone. We are gonna try this out and we're gonna set up the front end so that it's safe to drive at least. And um, if I don't like how high it sits or if it doesn't settle down a little, then I can just realign it later or take it in and have Les Schwab align it like I usually do. All right, step one of this deal. We've got these plates to roll under the tires. We're going to center our steering wheel, which is actually really easy to do with the Borgeson box. Boom, it's centered. I mostly just need to set the toe because I think the alignment will be close enough. Our camber seems to be at negative 0.5, which the range um, I usually shoot for is negative 0.5 to negative one. Negative one's technically a little better for grippiness, but that's okay. I'm checking them just because I can. You turn the wheel to 20 degrees left and we're gonna zero the gauge. Do I know what I'm doing? Why, why are you 0.1? Well, let's see what it says anyway. We're gonna go 20 degrees to the right. Whoa, if that's, if we're perfectly centered, 20 degrees should be one perfect turn. That's actually really convenient. I made a little paint mark on our thing and we do appear to be at 20 degrees. We take that number, 3.7, and we multiply it by 1.5, and that gets us our caster number, apparently. 3.7 times 1.5 is 5.55 degrees of caster, which sounds like a lot, but that's pretty much exactly what I want, actually. Uh, I will check the other side, and then we'll move on to the toe. This side was a little harder to dial in, get the uh, bracket on there and everything. This side says 4.5, which if you multiply that, turns into 6.75 degrees, that's a lot, but it's good enough. I'm gonna do the toe. Normally you want these more like a half degree apart. The camber, if I'm reading that one correctly, is a little higher on this side too, more like um, negative 1.1. So I definitely need to adjust them, but uh, for tonight, it'll do. Just looking at the front wheels, I can already tell this wheel is towed in a little, and this one, is towed in a lot. So I'm gonna start, before I take any, any measurements, I'm gonna turn this tie rod sleeve in just a little bit to try and kind of even them up, and then I'll take my measurements. This is where the quick trick really shines, I think. These brackets here have slots, and you just slide your tape measure in on one side, pull it across, pop it in, you take your measurement. It could not be easier. I need my handy cardboard creeper for laying on this. Horrifically dirty floor. We just reach right in here. And we turn it this way. Turn that nut out a little. Turn this one out. And that's closer to where the other one is. Time to throw the tape measures on. All right. Let's see what we got. I'm gonna release this, and it should pull it tight. Release this. Okay, we are towed in a lot. This is like 77 and more than a half. This one is 75 and a half. That's two inches of tow in. No, no wonder this thing was horrifying to drive. So basically, I turned both tie rod sleeves way too much. <sighs> Which makes sense. So I'm going to go in on this one. Oh yeah, there's a flat here, but it turns so nicely by hand. I'm just going to do that. 
76 and 3 16 76 and 3 quarter It's either perfect or as perfect as I can get it. This one's at 76 and literally just a hair under a half. So 76 and a half. This one is 76 and just that same hair under five eighths. So that's right about an eighth inch of toe in. So I think our alignment is good enough so we can drive the car to work tomorrow. The last step is to tighten up the jam nuts on the tie rod ends and then we can get this car out of here and finally drive it again. One more last thing to do, other than zip tying a couple wires while we weren't looking. Wiring up the brake lights so we can actually drive it on the street. Grab your handy 15, 16 wrench in this case. On a factory style, it's got the squeezy sleeves. So you just tighten the bolt that holds the sleeve and you're done. But on this, just got a couple jam nuts. Easy peasy. One inside's reverse thread. Yeah. Yeah. Tie rods are tight. I declare this fury roadworthy. It still needs an alignment, but it's closer. It's close enough we could drive it to work tomorrow. Brake lights still work. And it is my birthday, so why shouldn't I, right?
with the alignment not perfect, it's still, uh, I mean, it's a little more effort, but at the same time, it's easier to keep the wheel, the car straight, because I'm not having to waggle the steering wheel all the way around. Especially with these big wide front tires on it, it really accentuated the slop in the box. And I was just constantly sawing the wheel. This is like, the turns are a little more effort, but they're much smaller. And once I get it aligned up and it's actually going straight down the road, it should be perfect. We made it, almost. We still technically gotta get across the street. time than I've been. Ugh, everyone's coming to look at my beautiful piece of automotive excellence. I made it all the way to work and it hasn't even broken down yet. Actually drives pretty decent. Jason's mocking me for my lack of air cleaner so I better go grab the one I have in my toolbox so I What's can it? hush him up. That looks like gas. No it's antifreeze. Getting kind of crusty but Still looks better than the other one, and it's cool. How dare you mock my squeaks. Yeah, I know. No, it's gonna pinch on the gas. Well, that ain't gonna work. This line used to be extra long, and then I un... Longed it. <sighs> Making Jason grease the front end so I don't have to, because I don't wanna. Which part? Yes. What do you mean? What's wrong with it? We started this episode with a dead Plymouth, and we're ending it with a very much alive Plymouth. A Plymouth with a new 360. We've got headers, we've got the Borgeson steering box, we've got no more belt noise, we've got no more smoky exhaust. I think that's going to do it for this one. We'll get in alignment and do some test driving later. I'm going out of town for the weekend because it's my birthday. Just remember, if you leave your car sitting for long enough, you'll have your own barn find. Or driveway find, in this case. Thanks for watching.